believe it, baby. I was down with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did for me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on, we're going to do something different this morning. This is Pastor Thomas, why don't you do this? Put your hands together, come on. Come on, we're going to bring some old school feeling into you. Sanctuary today, the sanctuary of your house. You know what? I got nobody with me in the pianist here, but he's a gospel piano player. And so the praise team is gone, but come on, join me. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm gonna say this everywhere I go, you know this. Everywhere I go, church, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, everywhere I go, church, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, church, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Some of y'all know about that, but that's not what we're going to do right now. Just want to wake you up and let you know this morning, as we celebrate our 104th church anniversary, I need you to go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, come on. I know some of y'all still home patting your feet, ready to go. I could have gone on too. Just bring back that church feeling. You know, um, someone said uh, that our younger people don't like hymns. That's a lie. I've seen young people, young people go off when a hymn, because hymns are rich. They were written during those one-on-one -on -one moments with God. Come on. Isaiah chapter 58. And today it's a very rich passage. It's a passage we all know about. But I'm really only going to read two verses out of this passage, and we'll review the rest as we go through the text today. Verse 11 of Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that be they, they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of the paths to dwell in. Pray with me, pray with me really quickly. Father God, I, I, I need you now. Bring someone's mind in. Touch their spirit now, God, to be receptive to the word of God. Lord, I, I ask that you let nothing I say hinder what you want to say. And Lord, let us always remember that we are handling the word of almighty God, the unadulterated, the word, the divine word that comes from heaven. And Lord, we ought to realize that word is sharper than a two-edged sword and can touch us. So Lord... Bless now, I decrease, you come. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow for this 104th church anniversary, with our theme, A Light Shining in Dark Places, we're going to speak this thought. If you got the light, share the light. He'll take care of the rest. Share the light, and he will take care of the rest. I'd had a long week of ministry a couple of weeks ago, and I was, well, about a week ago, and I was on YouTube searching out some word. 
In case you didn't know, preachers also have their own preachers that we go to when our tanks are empty. And I got my own YouTube preacher I find to get me a good word. And as I was searching for the word going on the YouTube, I ran into a statement that stopped me. They do that on purpose. But the statement said, the church going crazy. And that caught my attention. And then I just said, well, let me look. So I turned to the channel. I stopped. And there was a guy talking about his channel. And he said these words. Well, here I am again with another one of those crazy church stories. And he said, I don't know what's wrong with the church. And then he commenced in a dialogue. And he showed some high profile celebrity, celebrity pastors that had done some, well, crazy things that had done some things. And I'm not going to name them, but I just will just name one. I'll tell you, of course, you need to know if you have not saw it, but they actually, he actually showed the Paula White incident. <laughs> I know. Um, I guess she was doing intercessory prayer for our president, Donald Trump, as the vote was coming in, and she wanted to get some angels from Africa, and wanted to get some angels to come in, and Anyway, it was a spiritual embarrassment. But anyway, because it just went on. And then it didn't help the way that they, you know, did the remixes on, <laughs> on social media. And then, though, he started talking about a pastor who actually um, had a fleet of luxury cars. I'm talking 12, 13. And he was talking about a one pastor who stole money. Then he, then he went to the pastor who had the fleet of luxury cars. And he said, what, what do you need all of those cars for? And then he talked about pastors fleecing the people. Then there was another pastor on the heel of that who actually was telling his congregation he needed a $54 million jet. Hmm. And he was telling them how they needed to help him pay for that jet. And he already had a couple airplanes. Then there was a pastor, a celebrity pastor, who just got fired from his church. And he was cheating on his wife. And it went on and on and on. And I was feeling some kind of way, y'all. I was angry as I read this because I, unlike some of my members, I'm not a Greenleaf fan. Uh, excuse me, Oprah. But I don't like y'all Greenleaf in the church all the time. All we show is the bad things that, yeah, church folk mess up. So that's what I was thinking as I was going through this. In my mind, I was thinking, well, this is just another one of those attacks from the devil. They never show the good side. There's some honest pastors out there doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then, you know, I rationalized that and said, but all y'all want to show is that. And then I also said to myself, I said, and you know what else? We're not supposed to be always pointing out sin. God is a forgiving God. And I start thinking, so after I got my mind settled back down, I decided to go on out and get my word. And y'all, I wish I could have done it. But right then and there, the Holy Ghost stopped me in my tracks and said, there's one thing wrong with your rationalization right here. He said, the one thing wrong is it was just not a few situations where the church was presenting darkness in an already dark world. It was a lot of, matter of fact, I could have gone on and on. There were so many channels showing some of the dumb stuff. And what God said to me is what I want to preach about. He was saying the church is in trouble. And it takes me back to what the channel started with. The church done going crazy. And I started thinking about it as I was preparing for this text. And here's what God laid on me. I need you to catch this. He said, see, somewhere along the line, we got in trouble because we started falling in love with getting instead of giving. Matter of fact, all of our, our vernacular, all of our preaching, everything turned into get blessed, get healed, get this. All we want to do is get stuff. Then we start talking about if you mess up, grace. If you mess up, grace. What kind of grace? Supernatural grace. So even when we mess up, we weren't talking repentance. We were talking Grace. Everybody can have grace or everybody's out looking for their Boaz. So we put everything into our relationship, not with God, but our relationship with other people and folk got off track. Or we walk around talking about I am blessed and highly favored. And we walk around talking about and I know I'm next in line for a blessing. And I thought about all of that. Hear me. Nothing's wrong with any of that except God never wanted that to be our focus. Y'all go with me. 
What God wants to talk about today is God said, I commissioned you, my church. I called you, my church. I blessed you. I saved you. That's right. Sit up wherever you are right now. He said, I blessed you and called you. So your light could shine. Yeah, there's going to be some times you messed up, but that's not, that should not be what the world sees in abundance. There ought to be times the world sees us. The only God they're going to see because God said, when I created you, I created the light in you. So the light in you would reflect my glory. How do I know that? Matthew 5, 16. He said, you are the light of the, no, let your light so shine uh, among men when they see your good works that they glorify your father that is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of a world and the city that is lit should not, on a hill should not be hidden. God is saying, you're the light You're like the city that draws people to me, and yet you're hidden because your light is so dark. Come on, y'all might as well go with me. We're in trouble until we understand John 12, 46. Jesus said, I came as the light of the world, and those who believe in me should not be hiding in darkness. John 12, 46. What am I telling? The scripture tells us we are the light of the world. God called us to give to the world why we can stand, how we are blessed to stand. And in our text, the verse that I read, verse 12, of Isaiah 58, and you're going to find out Isaiah 58, ooh, it's going to take us through a time when God was calling his church because they were going from mess to mess instead of repenting, and all they were doing was continually trying to serve God from a position that they had not made themselves shine with the anointing God has placed in us Let me slow down and tell you this. There's an anointing in you. The reason you've been blessed, the reason you've been saved, the reason you're still here is because when you walk through the streets, we're the only Jesus they're going to see. We're the light of the world. Can people see Jesus in you? We're the only Jesus they're going to see. And in in that 12th verse, listen to what happened. God said, and they that be of you shall build up the old waste places. You shall... Build the foundations of many generations. There's generations out there that won't know God. The world has gone dark. They won't know God without us. And it says, and you shall be called the repairers of the breach and the restorers of the path to dwell in. You know why I started with this little light of mine? Because we need to go back to some old foundations to understand we still have to live circumspectly in a world that's going crazy. We still have to have, that's right, we still got to talk about fasting, talk about repenting, talk about times when I, you know, I shut it down, talk about times when I know I was this close from messing up and I stepped over a line, but I ran back in. Today, I want you to know you got the light. You ought to share the light and God will take care of the rest. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that our verse tells us there's a dark world. That needs God. They don't want God, but they got to be able to see God in us. And if we ever let the light, the reality of who we are in God, if we let them know, pull down these, these masks we wear and let them know, if it had not been for God, I would not be here. They would not make it. I'm just saying, somebody out there ought to shine your light. You ought to be able to tell somebody, uh, the only way you're going to survive is serving God. When you serve God, peace comes. Come on, tell them that. We're we're the person that we're falling apart. I know you ought to be able to stand up and tell somebody it was that supernatural peace of God. Excuse me, John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 27. Remember when Jesus was on his last time teaching his disciples in that 14th chapter? He said on the 27th verse, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Hear what he said? There's a supernatural peace. Somebody else ought to say, when you serve God, I'm talking about shining now, talking about shining. When you serve God, healing comes. Oh, I know there's some folk out there who've been healed. I know there's somebody, even if you're sick now, you can remember a day when the Lord brought you through. Somebody ought to say what Isaiah said in the 53rd chapter, the fifth verse. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement 
chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes I am healed. Somebody ought to shine that out. I know I got some folk who can shine out some healing. Maybe there's somebody that can shine out. There's some stability. If you serve God, stability will come. Let them focus on that glory. What's stability? You ought to tell them, go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. I have learned, Philippians 4, 11 and 12, whatsoever state I'm in, to be content. I've learned how to be up. I learned how to be down. I've learned how to be content. All I'm telling you is no matter what happens when I'm hungry, when I'm not hungry, when I got God on my side, there seems to be some equilibrium, some stability. Oh, I know somebody know what I'm talking about. Somebody ought to shine. Can I get somebody to shine one more? Somebody ought to shine. When you have God, you got strength, you got help, and he's on time. What am I talking about? Psalms 46 and 1. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. And then the last thing is let them know Matthew 6, 33. Forget healing, forget peace, forget stability. Everything you need comes from serving God. But we got to shine that out. We got to tell this crazy world that there is some hope in God. Matthew 6, 33 says, watch this, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else will follow. That's what we're going to talk about today. Write this down. I'd like to tell you where I'm going. I'm going quickly into this text because this is some good stuff. I need you to go with me and write down three points that we want to talk about today. We want to talk about, first of all, how do I get to the place that I am shining and letting God get the glory in my life? First thing you got to do is share your light. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all things will follow. We're spending time trying to get ourselves right, spend so much time on our getting, spend so much time on our stuff that we don't have time to let God get glory. Stop wasting time on you. That's right. I'm talking to you right now. Stop it. Sitting around mumbling and worrying about what's going on. Here's what God said. Share your light. The first thing you got to do, share your light. In this text, God's going to tell the Israelites, share your light by letting me lead your life. Let God lead your life. Share your life by shining on God's goodness. Share your life by letting God lead your life. Share your life by shining God's goodness, as we just did a moment ago. It's in the text. Share your light, and you will receive his divine promises, precious promises. Share your light by letting God lead you. Share your light. By shining his goodness, share your light by letting, by receiving his divine promises. Let's look at the, let's look at the text. Verse 1 says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. So from the beginning of this text, God made it plain who he was talking to and what was going on. He said, cry aloud, spare not, be like a trumpet, tell the heathens. No, he didn't say that. Uh, tell the unbelievers. No, he didn't say that. Check the text. He said, tell my people that they are transgressing and that they have sin. Tell my people they have sin. God said, it's my people I'm trying to bring back to a place of understanding that I placed the light in you. You have so much power today. You have so, can I tell y'all something? Man, if, if we knew what two of us could do touching in the green, not cliche, but really knew what two of us could do touching in the green, there is so much power in us. See, let, let, let me show you where we are. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied to Judah and Israel, and he prophesied two messages. He prophesied first the judgment of God. He said, because you keep living in idolatry and keep halfway following God, only call upon him when you want something. He said, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to use Assyria and Babylon to punish you and judge you and rule over you. So you'll know you have to come back to me. He said, so the first thing he said is, um, your own actions of not following what I laid out in my covenant, watch me, y'all, is causing you to miss out on your blessings. It's causing you missed 
uh, opportunities. It's causing you missed deliverance. It's causing you a place where you don't have the power you need. I'm sitting out there looking at saints who should be, man, as long as you've been saved. This shouldn't be that merry-go-round where you keep going back. As long as you've been saved, you ought to know that you missed it. So what he said, he says, so what I'm telling you is you got to give your, your life totally to God. It's something that we now have thousands of year, years later in a new covenant. God is still saying the same thing. Paul had to say it to the church of Rome, verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now watch this. All I'm saying is you want to halfway live for God and halfway live with one foot in the the world and want to know why God can't, God's not responding to you when he should respond to you. All of us. Come on, I'm not pointing fingers at you because there's some times God knows that I find myself having to chastise myself and pull myself. Any believers out there going to be honest? I got to pull myself back because I know what I'm doing is not godly. My spirit is telling me, but the world can capture us if we don't repent. It seems it's crazy that we're still doing that. We're still missing blessings years later because we won't give our life to God. So God is saying, I'm talking to my people. So I want you to follow me on this today. He said, and then he, uh, Isaiah also prophesied about uh, the last uh, chapters from chapter 40 on, he prophesied, but God also gives hope. That's what I like about God. Somebody right there, that sometimes it's not the, 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 you know, the, the fervor and the excitement that makes you shout, but when you think about the fact that no matter where I am, God is a God of hope. Hmm. That's something, isn't it, that, that, that sometimes in the midst of our worst day, we can still have hope. And he said, because he's going to raise up a Messiah and he's going to come and establish his kingdom and you will get your power back. And then God said, but here's the problem. You won't follow me. Look at verse two. He said, here's what's going on. He said, you seek me daily. You want to know my ways, but you won't do righteousness. You come at me, you know, like you're doing righteousness and you seek my ways and you forsake my covenant. Here's what God says. Um, You got me puzzled. You got all those Bibles. You read all that scripture You want a daily word. You want to call people up and pray. You want to learn the latest Christian jargon. You want to find out Christian clothes. You know, not so much this pandemic has brought us to a place where we have to be honest because we can't have too much of a showy spirit while we lock down. But you got all the Christian stuff together. God said, but it's really funny. You want all that, but you don't want to serve me. And look what God said in the text. He said, you're coming at me as if you've been living righteousness. And got a nerve to be mad at me when I don't respond to you because you're not living. Here's what God said. You are really duplicitous. You're divided. You're you're an undercover agent. You're you're, you're the black James Bond. Excuse me. You are are a, a sleeper agent. It's like you want me until something in the world turns you on. I'm preaching right now. God said, I'm tired of you having Two points of views and wonder why I don't respond to your tradition. Because look what the next verse says in verse 3. It says, but we fasted and you didn't listen. Why should we keep fasting when nothing changes? And God tells them in this text, he said, this is what makes me scratch my head. You have no loyalty to me. You, you, you don't really love me enough. You still allow your emotions to go off. You... I, uh, there's times when you don't know how you hurt. I'm talking, for, I'm talking for God now, and I believe this with all my heart. There are moments with our saved, Holy Ghost, lovely self, I believe there's some days when we actually hurt the heart of God. Don't tell me God can't have feelings. I know it. I believe there's some days when we, when we hurt him because with all he's done, we should have, he should have a better response. You ever, you, ever, you ever had your back kicked in by a friend? You, you know, the only time in the text when Jesus wept is when those friends he thought should trust him did not. All I'm telling you is there's moments in our life when God says, I would have blessed you, but you're not loyal. You act like you only have the power of the world. Um, Kenneth Gilbreth was a world-known economist. 
And back during the 60s, all nations and, and people would hire him to straighten out um, their economy and to give them tips. And he was a, a well-known person who could go in and fix up a government. Well, he came in and he told his housekeeper, Emily, he said, Emily, I am tired. I had a week. Don't let me be disturbed. I don't want to be disturbed. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sleep. Take a nap. He went in there and laid down. The phone rang. Half hour later, Lyndon B. Johnson, the president, called from the White House. Emily picked up the phone. He said, "Um, this is Lyndon Johnson. I need Kenneth Gilbert. And Emily said, well, he's asleep right now, and he doesn't want to be disturbed. She said, woman, this is the president, Lyndon Johnson calling. I'm calling from the White House, and I want to speak to him. She said, no disrespect, Mr. Johnson, but I don't work for you. I work for him, and he told me not to disturb him. And she said, so you're going to have to call back. Kenneth Gilbert wrote in his autobiography that when President Johnson called him back, the president said, can you please bring Emily to the White House? He said, because she knows who she, she, knows who she serves. Did you hear that? Oh, God is saying, sometimes... You forget who you're serving. Kenneth Gilbert was supplying roof over her head. He was supplying her meals. He was giving her a paycheck. She didn't care if President Johnson called. God said, how come you so soon removed from loyalty? As soon as you hear another call, you must have forgot who it is that kept you. You forgot who it was that you cried out to last time. You forgot when all the options are gone, I'm the only option. Loyalty. And he said, look, you need to understand something. This is why you fast. Verse 4 and 5, he said, behold, you fast for strife. You, 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 you fast so you can debate. Look at the text. Uh, you fast so you can show off. You, you fast so you can maintain your Christian identity. Um, You make your voice heard on high. You want me to see you, but that's not the kind of fast I called for. I know your heart. God said, you're a good uh, debater. You know how we do? We we want to talk to other folk. You ever seen those kind of folk that um, they know when somebody else doing wrong in the sense that they were taught something, and since that's not what you're doing, yes, I'm going to stop. I know you heard this before, but God just told me it registered on somebody. How in the world can you point your finger at anyone when you really look back at the hard time you have in yourself just trying to stay holy? Can I get an amen? How can you tell somebody else what they ought to be doing when you're not keeping all your T's crossed and your I's dotted and your Q's and P's and Q's? You're not doing it together. What am I talking about? I saw this one pastor. He's known. I'm not going to mention any names. I'm just telling you that the church in trouble. We got to share it. Share your light. God will take care of the rest. Quit worrying about you and start thinking about how God get glorified. This one pastor, he had a sure enough fired message about homosexuals. And man, he could preach that thing and he bear down on them. And he was talking about, I'm not going to repeat some of the language. I still have too much respect for people to say the words that he called them in a scripture. And that ain't, that's not the bad point. The bad point was there was a church out there saying, yeah, say it. <laughs> they were laughing, and he was just telling it, and he went back in on the homosexuals. You know, wasn't even three months later, he fell from adultery. Somebody said, well, that's, no, no, here's the part. But he kept preaching. Here's what God said, see, you, you, you don't think your sin is anything, but you fast or you do your truth. All fasting was, was tradition. See, God said, because you like to fast. Fasting was one of those things they would do to show God they were still holy. I fast, and they would put stuff on their face, and they'd sit in sackcloth and ashes and old clothes, and they would sit there and say, Lord, how come you haven't heard us? God said, because that's not the fast I called. That fast is so you can Just talk about folk and tell people they're not as good as you. And you want to show people where they're going off. And God said, you need to understand something. You're good at showing, but you're not good at growing. 
God hit me with that one night, and it was hard to take that um, you're always trying to get right back to where you are instead of growing. And God said, you want that old feeling. You know, you get nostalgic. I just want to get that. God said, that feeling is nothing compared to what I have for you. God told me to tell somebody what he has for you is so much greater than what you had already. That's another shouting point right there. What he has for you is so much greater than what you had already. But I love what the text said. He said here, he said, uh, verse 6, point 2, share your life by shining. Is not this the fast that I've called? You better get this. God said, if you really want to get the power you need, if you want to get, if you want to really share your light to a dark fallen world, if you want to really be different, if you want to really feel my supernatural power, he said, loose the bands of wickedness, break heavy yokes, let the oppressed go free, um, um, undo heavy burdens, deal bread to those who are hungry, help those who hear what God's saying. Everything God said is, I called you to shine to the world, share your light so the world can see my goodness. There's people out there I want to help, but I can't help them if they don't see us making a big deal over God. If they don't see us letting people know he's the best thing that ever happened. If they don't see us shine. Here's what God said. The fast that I called is where you are working. You are showing the world how good I am because you know I'm going to take care of you. So all you think about is not just being blessed, but how can I bless somebody else? Do you know why God can't bless some of us? Because when we get that blessing, we're not going to give it out. We're not going to give it to nobody. We're not going to help nobody. All we're going to do is run around trying to shine our glory instead of God's glory. God said, no, the fast that I called is a fast where you understand who I am. And who I am is a God of love who wants to find other people who are like you and bring them to me so they can get what you got. You got the light. Share the light. I was in Wawa probably a month ago now. And I remember I was in deep thought about something and I walked in and I was putting on my mask and there was a guy walking behind me. I didn't even pay attention to him. And I heard somebody say, you know, hey, it can't be that bad. So I didn't think he was talking to me because I'm walking. I don't know him and he's behind me and, and I'm walking. And this white guy is I'm loudly. Hey. And I and so I turned around, you know, and I'm t- turned around with a little, you know, a little too little. Like, who you hollering at? But I met the biggest smile. He said, all I'm saying is, buddy, it ain't, it's not that bad. Just smile. This is a great day. And so it made me, you know, go into one of those half smiles where I said, <laughs> yeah, well, how are you? Yeah. And I walked on about my business. I was going in to get me a little sandwich and head on back to the office. And next thing I know, this guy walked over and said, hey, talking to the cashier. He said, whatever he getting, I'm paying for I felt bad then because I had gotten a sandwich and a a drink and I had gotten a couple things. And I said, no, no, you don't have to do that. He said, look, buddy, I told you, I got it. And I'm standing there and he walked out the store and they're ringing me up and I'm trying to get out to thank him. But when I got outside, he had already pulled off. Here's the kicker. I work with an ecumenical group. And we have been trying to bring, lift the burdens of people in our area. So we've gotten together multiple faiths and we were doing some outside services in a local park. Showing that the world was okay, God was okay, and we were all coming together. You know, Methodist, Baptist, Holiness, whatever. We didn't care about the title. It was all about Jesus. And I remember after that happened, I walked out there and guess who I saw standing up, clapping to the music, The same man who brought my sandwich. Here's what I want to tell you. 
When I ran outside and he pulled up, there wasn't no bumper sticker on his car saying, I love Jesus. When he walked up to me and he said, hey, buddy, and he was cheering me up, he didn't say, well, praise the Lord and God is good and, uh, you know, peace and bless. He said none of that Christian talk. All he said was, I am When I looked at him, I was astounded. I mean, he was living like a Christian, not just talking like a Christian. And when I saw that man, I said, that's what God means by light. That's what our fasting should do to us. It should change our hearts so that we are examples of what God does, not just walk around doing things that are Christian but not living them. When is the last time you went out of your way for somebody? When did you pay for somebody's coffee without it being something set up? When did you walk up and say, who can I feed? I know you're home, but God said because you're stuck in the house because of the pandemic, you got a telephone, you can get on your computer, call up some of the seniors and see if they're doing all right. Maybe drop by, put a mask on, lay a bag of food on somebody's table, on somebody's step for Thanksgiving. All I'm saying is you are to shine. They will see God. You got the light. Share the light. He said, this is the fast that I've called. This man who cheered me up and made me feel good, he was a blessing because I realized how important it is to the heart of God that I love you and I help you and you help me. And that's not our nature. We really feel we've done something special when every day that's what God's doing for us. Somebody ought to praise God right now for those times when he could have left you, he didn't leave you. You ought to thank him for those moments he had somebody take care of you. And if you look back in your life, you can find there was some time when somebody did something that saved your life. The question is, have you done the same, not in your name, but in the name of of Jesus. You know, the last, the first, there, there's two special times in life. The first time you meet someone or the first time you embark on something like, uh, the first time you meet someone and y'all get into, and you, and you fall into a relationship with that person, it's important how you talk to one another. You know, it's important as you're in a relationship what you say because it could be the last thing. When you first met each other, whatever it was, it turned you on. But when you walk away, it could be the last time. You know, it's the old, you know, when you leave the house, make sure you got on clean underclothes because you don't know if you're coming back. If somebody's leaving, make sure you tell them you love them because you want that to be the last thing. All I'm saying is I've done many funerals and I've seen people in funerals. You can tell when they live right. Not because they were a Christian. You can tell when they loved that person in that casket right. You know how? Because they sat there grieving, but they also were content. They were not sobbing crazily. They just, you could tell they felt that absence of that love of that person and not seeing that person every day. But then again, you've seen those other ones just like I have. They get to crying and falling out and got to be dragged out and dragged back in. And they want to jump up, ah, make noise in the middle. You know why they do that? Because they didn't, maybe, maybe that last interaction with the person they were supposed to love, they didn't love them right. And now they can't say anything. So they're screaming and hollering hopelessly. All I'm saying is last things are important. That's why uh, when Jesus' last thing he did after coming back, 40 days talking to his disciples, he said, I want you to wait for power from on high. You shall receive power. So he wanted them to know the power was coming. The last thing Apostle Paul did to Timothy was he told Timothy, he said, "Uh, Timothy, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. There's laying for me now a crown of righteousness up in glory and for all those. So what I'm saying is he wanted Timothy to know, come on, Timothy, you timid, but you got to fight. I'm going somewhere. Here's what I'm getting to. How come the last thing Jesus did when he left here, when he was teaching his disciples, how come he didn't, you know know what the last thing was, don't you? Well, you ought to go to the Gospel of John and see. You know what he did? He started washing their feet. He grabbed a towel, knelt down, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the God who was going back on high, pick up his, you know, his, his robes of divinity and go back on glory, sit at the right hand. He said, give me a towel, and he washed dirty feet. 
How come he didn't teach them how to cast out demons? How come the last thing he did didn't teach them how to do miracles? How come he didn't teach them how to speak in tongues? How come he didn't teach them how to shout? Because that's not what's important. He said, they shall know you by your love. The last thing he did, the last act before putting into motion redemptive plan and going to the cross was he showed them it's important that you love one another because in doing so, you shine an unearthly, supernatural shine that will point people to me. Last point. Verse 11 and 12, our text. Verse 12 says, and if you do this, it's right there in the Bible. They that be of you, it, it, that's, that's King James for those of you who will share the light. Know what you're going to do? You're going to fix up the old waste places. Because in the text, if I, if I could go back, he said, if you do this, If you love and do the fast that I said, he said, your health is going to come speedily. You're going to be like a water garden. If you do this, when you call upon me, I will answer. He said, if you do this, he lays out 13, 14 promises. God, go back and read them. Before he gets to the repairs of the breach, he just lays them out. He tells you, here's what I'm telling you. If you do that, I'll take care of the rest. I'll heal you. I'll deliver you. I'll bless you. I'll do everything else. And then he got down to the part. And if you believe this, if you will be the ones who do this, he said, you shall be called. Look at verse 12. First, you'll be, you'll build the old waste places. When the children of Israel came back from Babylonian captivity and, you know, they brought groups back with the rebuild the temple. Well, the old waste places were the places where God's Glory used to shine in the temple and in the tabernacle. Said there's some of us in there that still got enough glory in us that we're going to bring back that. Reg- we can start a revival just by showing people how good. Just showing people the light God has in us. Just showing people every day I get up and I thank him and I bless him and I praise him and I let people know this is who I, I walk around proudly knowing who I belong to. He said, you're going to build the old waste places. You're going to start in this messed up dark society. Uh, that's messed up by racial division and and political, um, I don't even know what to call it, evil. And when you look around at where we are, a mixed up people that are fearful, he said, you can bring back that power, the always places. He said, and then I want to leave this charge with you as I close. He said, and you will build the foundation Raise a foundation. Look what the word says in the text. You'll raise a foundation for many generations to come. Guys, if we don't tell what God has done, they may lose it. Tell them about that night you had to fight off a spirit. Tell them about that day you were walking so sick and God sent an anointing to heal you. Tell them about the time your family was falling apart, but you got down on your knees and God was able to revive. Tell them about how you held on. Tell somebody, get up, thinking about yourself, shake yourself, let God get glory because you're going to share somebody. As long as I can walk, as long as there's breath in my body, I will tell somebody it was God. So God wants you to know there is a whole world out there waiting to see his glory, waiting to see his power. If you got the light, Share your light. And maybe there's somebody out there, you want this power we're talking about, this power to be delivered, this power to be healed. It's a simple call. Thank you, God. All you have to do is trust. Let him in your heart. Trust him as your Savior. You can't make it in this dark world without God. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord God, I thank you that it wasn't too late. I give you my heart. I give you my life. Come now into my heart. I believe you rose again with all power in your hand. Now say this loudly. Because I believe it, I 
am saved. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God heard your prayer. I know we got to go. We're running out of time. But God heard your prayer. And right now, if you prayed that, you now have a light on the inside of you. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncans. Check us out on our website, on our Facebook page. This weekend, don't forget, we're celebrating our 104th church anniversary. This is Dr. Pastor Duncan saying, have a great day. Shine your light. Share your light. Him and leave it I was down but with no way up and I needed some help everybody breathing but not living just existing well and I needed some help somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free.